All right, it's one after. Let's get this party started. If you have gone through conventional sales training and you have seen mediocre results, today's Advisor Video Academy is not about that. We're not here to share strategies that don't work or only work for certain advisors. What you're going to get today is business development gold. If you haven't met me yet, I'm Laura Garfield, co-founder of Idea Decanter. I am hyper-focused on showing financial advisors how results-based video marketing works. And my co-founder, Sharon, is here too. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm Sharon and I spend my days helping advisors, coaching them on video to look great and sound confident and be successful in their video marketing goals. So welcome to the AVA today. We are here for 30 minutes and so we are inviting you to drop any questions you have today into the chat and Tracy and I are going to try to make sure we get those answered for you. And we are both so excited to have Aaron Botsford here, the founder of the Advisor Authority as our special guest. And for those of you who really like to connect the dots, if you know Aaron, if you know Idea Decanter, um, I heard Aaron's about Aaron's philosophy on your founder's story. And it really marries beautifully with Idea Kit's remote video service. We're kind of like peanut butter and jelly. I'd actually seen Aaron's personal founder's video before we ever met. And Aaron, I felt like I knew you. And that is really the power of video when you're building relationships. And now that we've drawn that line from the advisor authority to Idea to Cantor, Aaron, we're so happy to have you here and to hear more about high net worth prospects and how to close them. So for well, Thanks for having me, Laura. It's really great. And you know, it, it's so funny that we have connected the dots now because having a founder's video was so integral to the success of my practice and really the leverage that allowed, you know, I, I ended up with two offices, seven conference rooms consistently filled with clients of my firm, and I wasn't in any one of them. But in order for prospects to really connect with me, the philosophy of my firm, and then being able to pass sort of the trust factor off to the advisor that was in the room and make that connection, that founder's video was just, you know, and I did three different iterations of it before I felt like I really got it correct. So, you know, I spent a fortune getting it done and I'm so grateful to have you guys as a partner now and we can send our advisors to you and you can get it done in, in a much more efficient way. And so it's really been you guys have been a great resource for advisors and I appreciate that. Well, you alluded to your success story and your founder's video being just a piece of it. For those of you who haven't met, for those of our guests who haven't met you before, could you give us just a thumbnail of where you came from and where you are now? <laughs> well, um, I came from poverty. I was, my dad died when I was 11. My mom left my mom with six kids and no money. I went through a terrible ordeal in high school. I was involved in a car accident. I hit a guy on a motorcycle. I was charged with manslaughter. I went through a criminal trial, a civil trial. And I mean, literally, I was just a teeny tiny version of myself. You know, I I was the girl that killed that boy. I mean, so I married a man, a young boy. He fell in love with me and he was an Air Force pilot. And the thing that saved me, we moved 17 times in the first 14 years we were married. So I got to kind of reinvent myself and forget my past. And, and so then I wandered into a stock brokerage firm in 1989 and I was looking for a job as a secretary. Uh, that's how little confidence I had. And this guy said, I'm going to make you a stock broker. And I didn't know the difference between a stock or bond, never heard of a mutual fund, but I'm like, I'm 28 years old. I'm like, okay. So, um, you know, they, the rest, as they say, is history. I ended up you know, um, I ended up on the Barron's top 100 list in all categories. Uh, it was it was a rough road, I would say. I learned a lot of lessons. And so five and a half years ago, I sold my firm. And even before I sold my firm, you know, I thought this business is so hard. It can be so hard, especially making it to the top, learning how to deal with and, and find and close high net worth prospects, which is just really super efficient if you're building a company. And so I started having advisors come to my office. So for about three years, Every quarter, I would have 15 to 20 advisors come to my office and spend the day with me and just ask me any questions they wanted to. And I realized after having over 100 advisors come in, they all had the same questions. And so I thought, well, could I put together a program? Is there any way that I could leverage what I know? So I created an online course 
to teach financial advisors, you know, everything from what is the mindset, you know, the mindset of achievement, which is where it all starts, of course. And then we teach them first how to close prospects of, ever, of any kind. And then we teach them now how to find those 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollar prospects. So, you know, it's been a, it's been a great run. I'm super grateful uh, for I had mentors along the way. And um, so now it's my chance to give back to the industry that allowed me to become successful. So that's my story as fast as I can tell it. <laughs> well, I'm so excited that we have a chance to give our guests today kind of a peek into your system. We all know that timing is everything. And I think of it like a loaf of bread that is not getting any better with age. Is it fair to say that the clock is ticking once you've met a high net worth prospect? It's very fair to say that you have a very short period of time to um, to get them to say yes to you. And it's so interesting. I was reading an article this morning about, you know, building trust and building rapport. And I just started to laugh because I'm thinking if that's how people think that you close a prospect, they're just sadly mistaken. So, you know, I had a very specific formula. And what's really interesting, Laura, is that when I was in business, I was unconsciously competent. I had no idea why I had such a high closing ratio. I really didn't. It was just very natural for me. But when I decided to do this course, I had somebody from my team who literally followed me around for two years and, and may, you know, kept track of everything I said or did. And, you know, he had been a financial advisor himself. So he was like, oh my gosh, if I would have just known that maybe the, you know, my prospects would have said yes. So that's, so my thing is I just eliminate all of the all of the noise and just say my 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 program is not a coaching program at all it is a modeling program very prescriptive in nature say these words and the prospect will say yes to you and and so anyway hopefully that starts to answer that question so tell me are there fundamental differences between closing a 1 million dollar prospect and closing a 20 million dollar prospect Absolutely not. Um, it's actually much easier to close a $20 million prospect than a half a million or a million dollar. Because you have to realize, so my what I do when I teach my advisors, and I see some of my advisors here on the on the call today, Marianne, nice to see you. <laughs> um, here's the thing. So when it when prospects come in to see you, so I'm talking to all the advisors on the on, on the call, they have this expectation. They already come in with a preconceived notion of who you are. They expect you to pull out your pitch deck, their, your manager selection process. They, you know, there's certain expectations that they have. And so what I do is I turn the tables and I'm going to, the way, the way I close prospects is I point out weaknesses in the non-investment areas of their life. I've closed 99.9% .9 of all prospects without ever talking about investments. Because when I can point out, so I start off in the area of risk management and I say things like, well, there, whether you're worth 20 million or 200 million or anywhere in between, if an event happened, and let me assure you those events happen in a split second of time that would cause you to lose all that money, I don't really care how good your money managers are. And some of these events, you know, Laura, I guess I'm, I am, I'm lucky. I went through some of these events. I went through a car accident as a 16 year old and my my family was sued my mother thought we were going to lose everything she she had which was only our home she thought we'd have to pitch a tent on the high school football field because we were being sued as a result of a accident on my way to mcdonald's okay so i guess maybe i'm very attuned to the things that can happen and so all these people a lot of times especially men men are prepared you have a prospect that comes in Men are prepared for market declines, stock market declines, their portfolio going down. But what men haven't thought through, what they are not prepared for is they send their teenage son off to college and he gets drunk one night and he hits a plastic surgeon and they're being sued for $25 million. They're not prepared for that outcome. And so to me, I point out, you know, I have 22, we call them disturbing tracks. And I just ask them simple questions. So tell me, I understand you have a lake house. How, how is that lake house titled? Oh, yeah, it's in our name. And then I point out, okay, well, let's just, you know, let's just imagine you have somebody and you have a boat, I assume. Yes, it's a lake house. And somebody gets hit on, you know, gets hurt on your property. You know, they um, they have a ski, a, a boat skiing accident. 
And the problem with, you know, if it's titled in your own name, not only can somebody sue you for the value of the lake house, but anything else that's titled in that name, your brokerage accounts, your personal residence or whatever. So they don't realize a lot of times how vulnerable they are. And I feel like I'm a CFP and I feel like it's my fiduciary liability, my fiduciary responsibility to point out all these kind of things that can happen that they're just not thinking about. And a lot of times the answer I'll give was, well, how come my attorney never told me that? Or when we bought this house, how come my real estate agent never pointed that out? And my answer is always, I don't know, but if we work together, we can get that fixed. So my point, and it's really, the reason it's easier to close a $20 million prospect is they have a lot of moving parts. They typically have more than one, one resident. They have lots of cars. They have more to lose. And so they have, and a lot of times they have margin in their life. So they usually care about people other than themselves. So we can talk about, so tell me about your mom and dad and how are they financially? Are they financially sound? Or if something were to happen, do you ever anticipate mom or dad having to come live with you or you pay for a nursing home? Well, a $20 million prospect has the ability to do those things. So we can leverage, okay, would it be better to pay for long-term care insurance on mom or dad than have them come live with you? So those are the kinds of conversations it is so much easier when you have a $1 million client, all they can think about is not running out of money before they die. I mean, they're very, they're, their issues are very confined to, I don't want to be broke. And so, how, you know, it's like, okay, where do we, they don't have margin to do anything more than that, you know? There is such power in story. We find that in the, the video content that we create, that when you tell a story, it becomes so much more real and so much more memorable for your viewer. And it sounds like that's the same thing with these 22 disturbing tracks, these ideas of giving them a scenario, really putting them into a story that applies to their life. It totally makes sense. Erin, I know that you have a plan for that first meeting with the high net worth prospect. And we wanted you to share with the group today a couple of the important pillars of that. And one of them is where people sit at the table. <laughs> yeah. And before I talk about the seating system, I, and I, if, if you don't remember, the, for the advisors that are on this call, I'm going to give you a gift. And, and I'm going to tell you something. And if, if you don't remember anything else about what we talk about today, please remember this and write this down. In order for the prospect to give you a yes at the end of the first meeting, and I'm known, I closed every prospect of any net worth the first time I met with them, you know, husband and wife, I, I, and you'll see why it's important to have them. If they say, and, be, and I had a policy, I don't chase prospects. So if I didn't close them in the first meeting, that was on me, Okay no chasing prospects. And when you establish that rule, man, you get really good at your craft. As Laura said, yes, it's important when I'm talking about somebody that has a lake house and a boat, I'm going to actually put them in their minds. I'm going to put them in the boat. You've got to put them in the story. You're not trying to build trust or rapport, or all these other names. You put them in a story and you paint this picture. Okay. And at the end of your first meeting, and this is what I want you to write down, if they do not say yes to you, what you have failed to do, and we're gonna, there's a slide on this later on, but I'm gonna just repeat it again. What you have failed to do is demonstrate to them the consequences of doing nothing, the consequences of inaction. So you've pointed out a potential pitfall, someplace where Things could go awry and they're, you know, they're, they're retired, they're fat, dumb, and happy. They're out on their boat and they haven't done that tiny little tweak of planning of changing the titling of their lake house and, it, and, and things could just blow up on them. Okay. So, so, so and I got, I always say, this is your job to point out those potential pitfalls. And what's interesting, Laura, when you can do this effectively, and it only takes, I, I teach my advisor students, there's 22 different you know, potential lanes or we call them disturbing tracks to go down, but it only takes two or three with any prospect. And finally, when I see the guy start sweating or mm -hmm. I see the wife going, we need to take care of this. How come my, our attorney never said this to us? What's interesting is what you do is move, because let's face it, Laura, 
when a prospect comes in to see an advisor, okay, in the prospect's minds, they hold their attorney up here in their minds, their CPA here, their Mercedes dealer here, mm -hmm. and their advisor here. And why is that? It's not because we're dumb people as advisors, but everybody knows the barriers to entry in our industry are not very high. They know the attorney went to college, law school, passed the bar. They know the CPA went to college, got the CPA, you know, whatever. They had to go through a lot more training and they know we passed a series seven. And so what effectively what I teach my advisor students to do is to go from where we start here and I want, by the end of the conversation, I want the prospect to see you, picture you on par at the same level with their most highly regarded advisor, which is their attorney. And I can teach them how to do it. I, 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 would, I would almost set a timer. This is ridiculous. But I could tell I had them up here. I was up here within 20 minutes. That was my goal. So, um, and it was really fun. It got to be a game for me. And so anyway, so it's fun to teach the game. So when, when prospects come in, there is a lot of psychology to getting that yes in the first meeting. One of the pieces of advice I give to people is, first of all, you never give your approach talk. If there are two people in a relationship and one shows up, you cancel the meeting and you reschedule. It's that important. And it's really, and it doesn't matter whether they're you know, married, living together, committed relationship, gay, straight, it makes no difference. If there's two people, you must, you want to do your approach talk with both of them. And why? Because opposites attract and two people will always have competing interests. So to appeal to one by himself is, is you're not going to have taking care of the issues of the other. So it's best to have them both at the same time. If there is a male, female in a situation, you always seat the woman when she comes in, when they come in, you seat the woman at the head of the table and you seat the man on the side of the table. When he's looking at you, there's nothing behind you to distract him. Now, again, there's about an hour's worth of psychology about this, but she typically does not want to be there. And 80% of the population of, of the advisors are men. And so men make this huge mistake of they, they get a prospect and they completely, they, they want to bond immediately. So they'll, they'll go up and shake the guy's hand and say, oh, Joe, so nice to meet you. How about those cowboys? Or they'll talk about, you know, the master's tournament. They'll talk, they'll try and build rapport with him. And she's sitting there going, oh my gosh, you know, I, he insisted that I be here and he's completely ignoring me. So it's really just a tool in order to make sure you don't ignore her. You put her at a place, at a place of honor and guys, you pay attention to her more than him. You win her over. And it's, it's just really interesting. There's psychology of women, you know, you want, she, a woman, if you're, if you're a female advisor, a woman can see you as a threat. So you have to be very careful. You, you really have to win her over. The woman has to win the other woman over. And it was it's funny because I had a situation where <laughs> this woman, she was afraid I was going to steal her husband, her money, or both. I mean, it was crazy. Um, men, you just want to make sure that you include her in the conversation. By putting her at the head of the table, it's hard to forget that she's there. There's a whole strategy be how to get her to this head of the table because she's not going to gravitate there naturally. And I'm telling you, she's not going to gravitate there naturally, even if she's the CEO of a company. Interesting. So she will go and sit next to her significant other and it'll be a us versus you. So I, I wish I could go into more about that. But here's the thing. <laughs> the reason you want to do that, especially you men on this um, call, is that you never, ever, ever want her to exercise her superpower because everybody in the world knows that women in our culture, we have this superpower. I call it absolute veto power. She doesn't like you. If she feels marginalized by you, if she feels like I, he, he, he made me insist that I be there and then he completely ignored me, by the time she gets to the car, shuts the door, you'll be history. And so that's one thing you just never want. And there's been so many times advisors are like, you know, it's, I feel like everything went so well. I just don't know what happened. You ignored her. That's what happened. <laughs> so do you find that there's any difference generationally? Does, does what you're saying apply to 70 year olds and 50 year olds? 70 year olds and 50 year olds. I cannot tell you about 20 year olds. I don't understand that generation and they have no money. So they're not my ideal prospect anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, uh, it's for certainly I would say 50 and above who are my my prospects, who should be the prospects of everybody on the call. 
then um, that still holds true. It's it's at some level, all of us can go old school, right? So, so you mentioned your amazing closing rate in your career. And on the next slide, I think it is so interesting, this concept of inaction. Tell me what this is all about. Yeah, again, um, when you, when they come in and Again, these are just words. I teach them every word to say. So stop, don't make this up. Don't trial and error, do trial and error. You want to point out, you, you know, you say certain words. We're going to begin our discussion in the area of risk management. So we first start down the road of risk management and we ask a series of questions. And based on what they say back to us, then we know how to respond, right? So it's just very formulaic, not rocket science, but formulaic. Because these are things the prospect has never thought about. Nobody's ever brought up to them. And I can't tell you one time in my 31 year career where I did, couldn't find areas of weakness in their either risk management or their estate planning. And you don't have to be an attorney to do this. You don't have to be a CPA, but we but we go down these levels of, of questioning. A lot of it, um, it's, it's really funny about when we talk about putting them in the story, I'll give you one example. So I ask about estate planning. So tell me about your estate planning. So can I assume Mr. and Mrs. Smith that when the first of you dies, the second, you know, the money goes to the re remainder of you. Yes. So tell me how the money passes to your children. Does the money go to your children outright? They get it all at once. Or is it graduated? They get, you know, some when they're 30, a little bit when they're 35 and the rest of it when they're 40. And then I just sit and wait for their answer. So I've given them two choices. Does it go to outright or does it go graduated? And I kind of like, da, 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 I wait, I wait. And they don't really know. They, they don't remember and so they give me an answer and I know how to go back to them. And so one time I was saying, no, not just one time, but many times I'll say, well, okay, let's just consider this. Let's say it's graduated and the last graduation is at age 40. So let's say when, after the second of you dies, your youngest child is 42. So you, he's effectively blown through all the graduations because he's, he has some at 30, some at 30, some at 40. So now effectively he gets all the money outright. And what if he happens to be a doctor at the time and he's being sued for malpractice? Do you really want the money that you were intended to leave to your son to be available to satisfy a malpractice lawsuit? Well, no, I don't want that. And one time I said, well, what if, what if he's going through a divorce and do you really want the money that you were going to leave to your son to be available, you know, to, as a, a divorce in a divorce settlement to your now future ex-daughter-in-law? And, and the lady said, no, I've always hated her. The child was three years old at the time. <laughs> I'm like, the child's three years old, the boy's three years old, and at 42, the, the mother-in-law already knows she hates her future daughter-in-law. I thought that was classic. So, um, but it's that's where people go. I don't I don't want my money to go to somebody that shouldn't have it, kind of thing. So those those are the kind of things when you're putting them in the story. These people really saw their future daughter-in-law when their son was three years old, so. I use this technique all the time in first calls um, with people who are finding out about idea kit or remote video service. I say, what happens if you don't do anything? And their answers, the advisors, what they say always shocks me. I mean, it's deeper and more thoughtful and kind of scarier than I would have ever come up with like myself. So really flipping the script and asking him that question is, is a, Powerful tool. Hey, Aaron, we've got a couple of um, comments in the chat. Cheryl yeah. Henderson <laughs> says, if you anyone doubts Aaron's superpower, comment on women, ask a realtor. Same thing. Like this <laughs> happened. Hey, Cheryl, how you doing? And Eric had a question. My issue is that I don't usually meet prospects at a table, but rather behind my desk. Yeah, um, I, I would say that was how... I was too, and that was how the majority of people are. So a lot of times, if I'm going to do that, what you don't want to do is have a me versus you scenario. So if that's the only situation you have, like it, it's really nice if you can have a couch and a table and chairs in your office. If nothing else, then put her on the side of the desk. You're sitting behind your desk. Put her on the side and the guy across from you. You just don't want a me versus you scenario set up. That's just a dangerous scenario to set up. There's so much, like I said, 
psychology, it's like basic DNA, you know, from the dawn of civilization, humans reacted this way. And a me versus you cuts down your, you know, you want to set yourself up for success. You want to set yourself up for we're we're sort of on the same side of the table kind of thing. So um, so Eric, maybe be- start holding your meetings somewhere else besides behind your desk. Just an idea. Yeah. <laughs> Aaron, we brought up the idea of stories several times. A founder's video is a piece of this system. And as I've worked with advisors who have gone through your program, they come to me asking, hey, can I create a founder's video? Because they like to show it when that prospect arrives for their first meeting. Tell us how that works. Yeah, so that's what what I did was because, as you can tell, you asked me very quickly, tell your story. And I could have gone on and on. My story could last four hours, right? And that's inefficient. So to me, what I did was I scripted my story to be two and a half to three minutes. I need to, because clients want to know you, they want to know, and there's a formula that we use that something, you you had a challenge in your life and you overcame it because overcoming adversity in our culture is always appreciated and applauded because everybody has gone through adversity. So they don't really want to see you in the slick suit with that fancy pen, like, you know, I'm all that, I'm Slick Joe. They, they want to see you as a human being because they're entrusting you with their life. You know, their money is their life. And for them, the scariest thing in the world is to turn their life savings over to this stranger. Okay, what if they're wrong? What if they make a bad decision and you lose all their money? So somehow you've got to get through that, you got to get through that barrier because they walk in kind of like this, they're scared. And so having a founder's video will just, it's way more efficient. You don't want to take the chance when you tell your story verbally, like I did earlier, I took the chance that you saw me as, oh my gosh, she was in a car accident. She hit somebody. She must be a loser, right? I mean, I didn't have the opportunity to tell you the other side of that story that, you know, I was found not guilty, da, 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 right? In a founder's video, you can write it so that formulaically it works, right? There's no, so, so what I would do is when a prospect would come in, I had somebody greet them and the way we got, remember, you know, you said, seat the woman at the head of the table. How are you going to do that? Well, my staff person would greet them, leave them in the lobby, get their drink of choice, and they would put her drink at the head of the table, his drink where we wanted him to sit. Then they would stay in the room. They'd say, you know, Erin liked you to show, see your founder's video. They would tee up the video before I ever walked in the room. Okay, so again, time is money, efficiency and all that. And and so that's how we made it happen. So when we, when I walked in the room, they knew who I was. So we there, get, there are the so many more messages that get delivered in video too, like that you couldn't um, deliver in a phone call or an email um, or a letter. All of the, yeah. the the tone of voice, the the gestures. It's just when people use this technique, whether they're they're emailing the video out in advance or they're um, showing it when the prospect arrives for the meeting. What they find is that when by the time that you sit down with them, they feel like they already know you. And I want to queue up. I know we're running up against the end of this. Um, this is such valuable information that we're going to run a little long today. But I want to show you a clip we have of an advisor named Lynn Berry um, who created a founder's video. And this is just a piece of it. And as you're watching it, um, you don't know Lynn likely, um, although I know you do, (laughs) Erin. She's one of my students, yeah. For the rest of the crowd, evaluate this as how you feel like you are connected or know it. No, no, Lynn, as you watch this. I had an executive once ask me if I knew why she and her family worked with my firm. Of course I was interested. She said, Lynn, I know that if I dropped a penny, you'd stop, you'd pick it up, and you'd hand it right back to me. That's why. 
That was decades ago, and it still holds true for her family today. That's something my parents ingrained in me. My dad was a chemical engineer, obviously process-driven, as most engineers tend to be. And my mom, well, she was mayor of Nina for 16 years. She was elected back in the 80s, before it was customary for women to run a municipality. She was smart, articulate, and a true trailblazer. The values that they demonstrated and gifted to me were a dedication to vision, a commitment to service, and a respect for the importance of process. These days, I'm a bit of a health nut. Green juice, growing my own sprouts, and gardening. When it comes to quality of life, you want to be able to pull the joy out as long as you're here. To me, healthy living is kind of preventative medicine, just like having a solid financial life plan. So that's just a little clip of her video, and there isn't a piece of the adversity story in there. But Erin, I think you'd agree with me. When you watch it, you do feel like you know where she's coming from. No, I love I love her video. Awesome. And I love Lynn, so. <laughs> <laughs> we do too. <laughs> well, Erin, I know that there are folks on this call who are not yet working with you and might want some more information about how to do that. Oh, yeah, so um, I have yeah, my training program is called the Elite Advisor Success System. All you have to do is go, gee, they've got the link on the bottom, erinbotsford.com slash decanter. Because of our um, relationship with Laura and Idea Decanter, you can get a 60% off discount from retail. Um, the course is actually lasts about six months. And I ask you to spend, if, if you want, to, my goal is for you to 10 times your business in the next three years. That's my goal. I was able to do that multiple times. And, and so what I do is I ask you if you can spend an hour to two hours a week, every Monday, I'm going to send you a, an email saying, this week, I want you to study this lesson. Okay. And it'll take you everything, every place from the mindset of achievement. What, what does your head have to look like? What, what do you have to think about in order? Like, why would you want to 10 times your business? Well, I can tell you, there's a lot of people out there who could use your help. My, my husband and I, we support 500 children at an orphanage in Livingston, Zambia. So part of what I do today, I give part of the money that we make today to, to, to feed kids. And there's another 1.7 million orphans just in the country of Zambia alone. So to me, in order to do what it takes to be a superstar in our industry, you have to have a big enough why. And until you can get a big enough why, you're not gonna put the work, you're not gonna do the work to get there. So I take you through a mindset course, then I take you through first selling, how to close a $20 million prospect in the first meeting. Because Laura, you and I, we and I talked a little while ago about, I think it's so interesting because most advisors come to me and say, you know, can you help me find those $30 million prospects? And I said, sure. But if I put you in a room with 50 $30 million prospects, would you have any idea what to say to them? Would you know how to close them? And the answer typically is um, no. So why don't I teach you how to close them first, what their issues are? And what's so interesting is that, you know, that saying when the when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, what we, my student, my advisors have figured out is when the advisor is ready, those high net worth prospects will appear. And it ha it's happening now. I've trained over a thousand advisors in the last four years. It's happening over and over and over again. So we, we talk about closing, we talk about prospecting, we talk about leveraging your business by hiring staff. And the big thing, and I see a lot of guys on this call that probably ought to be thinking about this next question is your exit. What do you, I always ask, what do you want to have happen on the last day you're in this business? What, and, you know, and then what does your business need to look like? So on the last day in my business, I got a ginormous check all at once, got a cash, cash out offer, you know, but do you want to leave your business to your son, your daughter? Like, what do you want to have happen? And the dollar figure, what you know, your, what your business is worth on that last day is gonna be defined by what your business looks like. Case in point, the day I sold my company, the buyer bought another woman's firm. She had the same amount as AUM as me, but she had two big things going against her. One, all of her clients were used to meeting with her. She was the girl, she was the lady, she was the brains. And second, um, she had had a massive stroke, so she had to sell. So I was told she got 25 cents on the dollar compared to me. Now, what a sad thing, she was about the same age as me and everything, 
but she had built the business around her. Instead of selling the philosophy of her firm, she sold her. And the risk to the buyer was that those clients would go away. So that was priced into the value she received. So for those of you who are within 10 years, 15 years of retiring or selling your company, and none of us knows whether we're going to have a stroke next week, right? I mean, to me, the reason to work on your business is so that you get top dollar for it when you're ready to, to leave. So those are all the things that I cover in my course. Again, you can go to aaronbosser.com slash decanter, get a 60% off discount. You can get started today. And the nice thing about my course is you can blow through the entire course this weekend if you want to. It's open architecture. You can do every single lesson, everything this week, or we meter it out to you, which, you know, and so a lot of times people will go through the whole course and go, okay, this is something I really need to focus on. Now I'm going to go back here. But in either case, we also have live group coaching calls with me. And once a month we get on, you can ask any question you want. And my, my goal is I just want advisors to be successful, uber successful, and I want them to do it in the shortest time possible. So hopefully that helps, Laura. Thank you so much for, for your partnership. And um, we appreciate everything you do for our, our advisors. Well, the success of each of the advisors on this call is important to us. And it's why we have the Advisor Video Academy once a month. We'd love to invite you to join us next month. It's Wednesday, August 16th, same time, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern. We will be featuring David Roberson, the founder of Azella Advisor. Um, he will be sharing the secrets to running a successful digital marketing campaign that drives leads right to you. So we'd love for you to join us there. Mark your calendars. And before you go, if you'd like to find out more about creating studio quality videos with IdeaKit, that's the same system that Lynn used for her founder's video, that clip you watched. This is a link you can follow to schedule a demo to find out how IdeaKit works. Erin, I'm not even an advisor and I want to take your course. I think <laughs> anyone could get value out of it. I would like to close a $20 million prospect and I don't even know what to do with them. <laughs> In any case, Everything you've said today has been so incredibly informative and thoughtful, and thank you so much for sharing your expertise. AVA OG members, you know we always like to end with a quote, and so today it's, if you quit the process, you are quitting on the result from Idowo Koyanika, and I think that's correct. That was a hard one to learn. Um, anyways, have a great Wednesday, everybody, and thank you so much.